Hello, welcome back to the show today. We have a women's health topic. I mean, it's pelvic floor related most of the time. It actually is. But we are covering the pelvic floor. Uh, what have we got here? The most common pelvic floor uh, functional disorders and uh, contributing factors um, of dysfunction. Actually, no, I lied. <laughs> I made that up as I was reading the title. The title of this narrative review is The Most Common Functional Disorders and Factors Affecting Female Pelvic Floor. So I actually got that around the wrong way and I tried to redeem myself <laughs> in the recording, but it didn't really work. Now, if you are a, um, let's say a member, I'm going to call you a member because I think it's cool, member of my email list, you will know that I sent out a research spotlight email at the beginning of October that basically covered this narrative review. And I love this narrative review. I love it so much that at the top of it, I have literally written in bold letters, golden with an exclamation mark and circled because this is something I read a while ago. And I was like, man, the value inside this narrative review is insane. And I wanted to share it. And another reason why I wanted to share it is because it really highlights the, how do I say this? It really highlights, I guess, the the variety of things that feed into pelvic floor function, but also the fact that it is like dysfunctions will come about in different phases of the lifestyle based on changes that we go through. It's also uh, got so many roles in other, I guess, other things other than holding in your pee. So when we look at the pelvic floor and I guess I want to say like rehabbing it or resolving dysfunction, then it's not always just about pre and postnatal health. And I think that's probably what it boils down to is why I'm presenting this is because when I first got into pelvic floor rehab and trying to help clients with this problem, all I could find was like pre and postnatal health and like keep your pelvic floor safe during pregnancy and pelvic floor weakness in the postnatal period and prolapse in the postnatal period. And I think it wasn't until like I had clients that weren't in that window but I was like, this is still a problem, but do I still do the same thing? Like, do I rehab it the same? Like, I don't have to consider the fact that they've just been pregnant because it's not really fresh, you know, I guess, stretched tissue or fresh cesarean deliveries. And I just thought like, oh gosh, surely there's going to be something else around this. And then when you kind of start diving into all the things that affect the muscle of the pelvic floor, I like to call them the drivers of dysfunction. We know that it can be affected at multiple different parts of the life cycle, but for also many other reasons other than childbirth um, or pregnancy. So I think when I read this paper, I was like, oh, oh my gosh, this is literally like the golden of the golden information that you need to know about the pelvic floor in a sense of having various uh, dysfunctions or disorders, along with many factors that contribute to its actual function and also how many, like the different roles that it actually plays as well and how it, it might not always just present as symptoms of incontinence. Um, so I want to get stuck into this. Now, I'm going to start by reading a quote because we love a good quote here. And basically this whole paper is full of quotes that I could just read. I mean, I could just read you the whole paper and this would be more like a story time, but I feel like the abstract is always my favorite thing to read because I feel like it really sums up everything um, that's important. However, in the case of a narrative review, the abstract obviously only has very minimal information because the actual review is more about education and many other things. Whereas like, you know, your, your, your little abstract in more of like the uh, clinical trials um, tell you a little bit more information about the whole thing so you don't have to read the paper, <laughs> which I used to do at uni all the time. I will admit I was an abstract fiend and hated reading the research. And now it kind of just depends on the research paper and whether or not um, it's written in a, I want to say, user-friendly way because clinical research sometimes is hard to read. Anyway, all right, so our quote, our quote starts off with, I'm going to read this directly from the paper, pelvic floor plays an important role in continence, pelvic support, mictrusion, 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 I don't really know how to say that, but whatever, De defecation, sexual function, childbirth, and locomotion, as well as in stabilizing body posture and breathing, and cooperates with the diaphragm and postural muscles. In addition, pelvic floor associates with distant parts of the body, such as the feet and neck through myofascial connections, due to tissue continuity, functional disorders of muscles, 
ligaments and fascia, even in the areas that are distant from the pelvic floor, will lead to pelvic floor disorders, including urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, prolapse, sexual dysfunction, and pain. Dysfunctions of pelvic floor will also affect the rest of the body. What a muscle. This is insane. It honestly does so much. Like when you think about that quote itself, it's like, man, like it is so important in the whole function of our body that like, why do people only associate this with holding in your pee? Like all your clients will just be like, oh, I don't have a pelvic floor problem if they don't have incontinence, but they actually may, they may, because it is so central in everything. Now. The actual narrative review goes into basically three parts. It talks about the introduction, uh, which also probably covers, well, it does actually cover the anatomy side. And it talks a little bit about all like the more nitty gritty anatomy, or at least a little bit of it um, in a sense of, I guess, understanding the the pelvic floor. Um, So it talks about one thing I actually want to talk about with the anatomy is that it is not one muscle. So if you are new to pelvic floor, health, then you will understand that it is, um, well, you might not even know that it is actually more than one muscle group. So there's like layers, different layers of the pelvic floor. There are different muscles themselves. And there's also different, technically different compartments, which make up sort of like the anterior, the middle and the posterior compartments that um, basically describe what organ is housed in that area. So we've got like the anterior compartment, which includes like the bladder and the urethra. We've got the middle compartment, which includes the vagina and the uterus. And then the posterior compartment, which includes the anus and the rectum. Um, Now that's just sort of like, like grouped, I guess we can call them grouped in those areas. The actual muscles themselves aren't like anterior muscle only, middle muscle only, and posterior muscle only. They've kind of got different layers based on like the function of them and what they actually do, like either sphincter muscles or like... um, I guess more like more support muscles, but you can read a little bit about that if you want to. I'm going to link the research paper title um, in the notes of this episode so that you can go check it out if you want to. But I think it's really important to understand that there's these middle, like, um, I guess, organs that sit in different parts of the pelvic floor or areas of that or compartments as this paper refers to it as, because we can also basically identify certain symptom presentation with maybe dysfunctions of particular areas of the pelvic floor, which I think is um, pretty cool from a perspective of not being able to internally assess. Um, So talks about the anatomy. Then we go into, after that, it goes into the roles that it plays. Now it talks about um, two things that I wanted to talk about here is that it plays a role in stabilization and it plays a role in respiration. So let's talk about stabilization first. So then I get to my paper. So basically we're talking about the role of stabilization of the of the trunk um, because of its connections with the abdominal wall, but also through the diaphragm and also through the glutes as well, which means that we also have a good um, understanding that the pelvic floor will play a role in pelvic stability as well. And this is not because the pelvic floor itself directly attaches to all of these areas and then if it's not working very well we don't have stabilization it's about how the i guess um tension in all of these other muscle groups that are attaching to the pelvis can then impact the pelvic floor or the tension in the pelvic floor can then impact pelvic positioning or maybe even fascial connections that go into these other muscle groups that are acting to stabilize the pelvis and the trunk. So predominantly when we're thinking about muscles that act on the pelvis that are really important for stability are usually sort of like the pelvic muscles, including like glutes and the rotator groups of the pel of the hip bone. So we're looking at like piriformis, obturators um, as well. And then also you've got other muscles that are acting for stability as well. But those are the three, the, those are the mostly ones that I'm talking about here. And they are really closely linked with the pelvic floor. And you will know that because if you listen to the other episode that I talk about the hip and the pelvic floor, and we talk a lot about um, the rotator group muscle in that as well. And a lot of research actually does dive into those, which I'd love to touch on more anyway. But these muscle groups themselves, so the glutes and the rotators, are influenced by the tension of the pelvic floor muscle. And because of these rotator groups and glutes play a huge role in like lower limb biomechanics, then we know that 
pelvic floor itself can therefore impact the biomechanics of the lower limb. So we're going to see issues with hip stability, with knee problems, with ankle and foot mechanics, or we can see issues vice versa. So if there's foot problems, if there's knee problems, if there's hip problems, potential impact into the pelvic floor and then maybe the pelvic floor symptoms are then secondary to those problems. So there is a lot of a lot of cover, uh, a lot of information that is covered in this paper about that particular role in stabilization of the trunk and also through the pelvic floor, uh, sorry, the lower limb and the pelvis. Now, um, let me just double check my notes to make sure that I didn't want to talk about anything else in that in particular. But um, mostly that is what's important in a sense of like when I'm looking at uh, rectifying pelvic floor dysfunction, symptoms of that, or maybe it's hip pain. Like it depends on what the problem is, right? Like are we looking at pelvic floor being the problem causing these issues or are we looking at hip, knee, foot problems causing pelvic floor dysfunction? Who knows? But when we're looking at problem solving around this, we need to be considering all of these muscle groups and how all of them are influencing each other in a sense of then bringing a bit more balance to the system. So I'm a really big believer in muscular balance around the pelvis and the trunk causing a lot of problems for the pelvic floor. And this is one of the reasons why is because they're really related to central stability. When I talk about this in the sense of um, rehabbing in the mentorship program, this becomes a really big like light bulb moment for a lot of the mentees where they are basically realizing that their clients that they see who maybe have back problems, maybe they've got pelvic pain, maybe they've got hip problems, knee issues, foot and ankle problems. Those ones aren't as, I don't, I don't see them as, co as commonly as a problem, but they're realizing that they've missed a whole part of their rehab by not focusing on the central stability system because they haven't had any knowledge about the role that the pelvic floor is playing in their central stabilizing system in order to then, I guess, retrain the muscle groups around that area that then bring like bring more balance to whatever joint that they're working through or pain problem or just like whatever uh, pathology that has in order to rectify that problem. So when they've started to like bring in this whole central stability, they're just like, wow, this is really helping all of my clients that I didn't realize were missing this like deep stability system mechanics or coordination, which we're going to touch on as well. So coordination of the system of um, the pelvic floor with breathing and the deep abdominal wall is actually so important. So the second role that we're talking about with the pelvic floor is in respiration, which if you don't know this already, breathing is the essence of pelvic floor health. And this is because there are many myofascial uh, connections to the pelvic floor or from the pelvic floor to the diaphragm, to the transverse abdominis, to the intercostal muscles, the oblique muscles, the thoracolumbar fascia, and therefore pelvic floor and breathing can affect each other. So whether or not there's pelvic floor issues affecting breathing or whether you have poor breathing mechanics, which affect the pelvic floor. This is the first step when you're actually rehabbing anyone or resolving symptoms or trying to retrain the muscle group. We're actually looking at the coordination between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor or what's going on there. Because if you do not address someone's breathing, you're basically missing like a key, key, key component to restoring pelvic floor function. So the paper goes on to talk about that, the role that the pelvic floor plays during breathing through its fascial connections to the muscles of the abdominal wall, the thoracolumbar fascia and the intercostals, and that the cyclic nature of respiration, like along with the interplay between all of these muscles is what actually maintains intra-abdominal pressure, which is a huge concept in the in the world of pelvic floor dysfunction because we'll you'll see this on social media, manage your intra-abdominal pressure and it's, you know, you haven't got uh, pressure management and blah, blah, blah. So basically um, intra-abdominal pressure is a concept that we cover a lot in terms of pelvic floor health and the mechanics of your breath and your pelvic floor and the abdominal wall and how all that works together is basically what helps us maintain this pressure or uh, I guess um, generate different levels of pressure in order to help us move. So it talks about the role in respiration. Really important. Then it goes into pelvic floor dys dysfunction. So part two is talking about, I guess, the types of pelvic floor dysfunction. 
And it talks a lot about that the common causes of pelvic floor dysfunction are weakness, damage in supporting structures, and incorrect functioning of the pelvic floor muscle. And that might be something um, that's, I think, well, basically when you read on from the paper here, it talks a lot about the disturbance of muscle tone um, and abnormal pelvic floor muscle contraction. So that would be something maybe more associated with overactive pelvic floor or high tone pelvic floor muscle or um, tension tightness. I mean, a lot of people refer to it as hypertonic pelvic floor, but it's basically more characterized by a lack of relaxation of the pelvic floor um, rather than, I guess, weakness. So those are the common issues. So we've got damage in supporting structures, which is something more um, associated with prolapse where there's um, downward descent of the organs or we have things like weakness so that would be like muscle tissue weakness as well or laxity in the system where we don't have enough support and we can't generate enough contraction or i want to say strength to close off um or what we call uh closure pressure so closure pressure onto the urethra holding in urine so now if we go back to the compartments of the pelvic floor and we're talking about the anatomy here we're going to see dysfunction to each compartment present as different symptoms. Now, there's not always one isolated dysfunction in the pelvic floor muscle group, let's say. So you're not just going to have one little muscle that's not working really well and then the rest of it's fine. It's usually all related because it's so closely connected and tension in one area pulls in the other area, or weakness in one area puts more demand on another area. So it's all kind of related. But generally, if there is more problem in one section, you're going to see symptoms associated with that section or compartment, shall we say. So for example, if you have more anterior pelvic floor problems, they're going to you're going to have more issues around like urinary issues or bladder problems. Whereas if it's posterior pelvic floor issues, then you might see more issues with fecal incontinence or maybe constipation or tailbone pain. So um, I think that's what it's really important to understand the anatomy and how that could manifest in symptoms. Because if we're looking at someone comes into the clinic and they've got maybe some symptoms then we can sort of problem solve around like, oh, what area do we need to like maybe bring more awareness to in terms of pelvic floor strength or bring more relaxation to because maybe they don't have much control there or maybe there's too much tension in that area because one of the other muscle groups around there isn't working very well and it's now overworking or over recruiting. So we need to like bring more balance to that, that specific area. So when we're thinking about like pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, those are the common issues. It's going to be basically like a weakness issue, a damage issue, or incorrect function of the pelvic floor muscle. Now, there's a great little graph inside um, this part of the paper, and it says like the most common pelvic floor dysfunctions among women, and it lists them off like a little mind map. So we have in this great little graph here, we have urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, puborectalis syndrome, dyspareunia, dyspareunia dyspareunia I am honestly I don't actually know how you say that it's basically pain <laughs> pain with intercourse which I usually just say pain with sex or pain with intercourse then we have vulvodynia pelvic organ prolapse chronic pelvic pain and dysmenorrhea so we've got those are the most like common pelvic floor dysfunction I guess presentations that you'll see among women but um there's there's obviously more like there's more now, when we um, look at factors affecting the pelvic floor, this is the part of the paper that I shared a lot in the re um, email that went out. So I think this is really great to see that this is where we can see um, understanding how the pelvic floor can be a problem at any point in the female life cycle is really important because it lists them off in topics. So we're going to go through them individually. We're not going to touch too far into them because... Um, this episode will go forever. But basically, first point of call is the most popular one, which we talked about, is pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. And in a sense, obviously, there are very clear structural changes that happen during this time to the female body, as well as the pelvic floor is actually impacted directly itself at this point in time. But we also then have hormonal changes at the same time that do impact the pelvic floor and the supportive structures around the area. Um, the birthing experience of the mother and any interventions that happen at this time can really impact the pelvic floor types of delivery. So whether that's a cesarean section um, or whether or not they're going through a vaginal delivery, 
And obviously, if there's no real postpartum recovery, this can leave women with very poor pelvic floor function. Um, and that can manifest in a variety of symptoms. So yes, it is possible that a postnatal woman has tightness in her pelvic floor. Yes, it is possible that she has weakness. Yes, it is possible that she has also a prolapse. So they're multiple. It just don't always assume that it's a vaginal birth. So there's weakness because that's not always the case. Now, so that's the first one that's obviously affected. The second one is age related hormonal changes and general aging itself. Now it touches on obviously the the decline in um, sensation around the bladder and the anus. It also talks a little bit about um, the ratio of muscle fibers that change as well as atrophy in those uh, muscle tissues um, that are related to obviously aging. But then it also talks about estrogen decline and that this impacts um, many components of the female reproductive and urinary system. So that might include changes to the pelvic floor, but it also includes like loss of integrity of the tissue and also muscle atrophy, which we just touched on. But not only are the hormonal considerations a problem during perimenopause and menopause, but we can also see that pelvic floor issues change throughout the menstrual cycle due to fluctuating hormones. So if obviously when you're prepubescent, you're not having pelvic floor problems related to the menstrual cycle because you haven't got a menstrual cycle yet, but then we go through menstrual cycle and we can get symptom changes during this time. And then as we get further on closer to perimenopause and menopause, then we have like estrogen levels changing, which also then impact the pelvic floor in a different way as well. So hormonal changes that are, well, typically age related in menopause, but also throughout the female life cycle are problematic for the pelvic floor. The third one that we can talk about here is obesity and metabolic syndrome. And this has a lot to do with increasing intra-abdominal pressure that goes down to the pelvic floor and the supportive structures, which potentially does result in weakness, but has also got implications for glycemia disturbances that damage vessels and nerves to the pelvic area. So I want you to think about this as like peripheral neuropathy. However, it's in the pelvic floor and this is actually a problem. Um, Believe it or not, I don't actually see many like clients associated with this. However, there has been a couple of mentees speak about this, about their type 2 diabetes clients that have had pelvic floor issues and whether or not there is actual nerve problems making it really hard for them to connect to or maybe like the function of the pelvic floor is a problem because of that. But also they have the excessive weight and pressure down onto the pelvic floor, which contributes to weakness as well. So not ideal. Obesity, metabolic syndrome, still problematic for the pelvic floor outside of pregnancy, obviously. Number four is respiratory uh, system diseases or respiratory illnesses or whatever you want to call it. Chronic coughing, not, um, not it's, it's really high amounts of intra-abdominal pressure, but it can also exert a lot of force down onto the pelvic floor and the abdominal wall and affect the respiratory system like biomechanics so when we think about the pelvic floor and the diaphragm relationship that we talked about and its role in respiration issues with respiratory conditions and illnesses will change or impact the pelvic floor itself so if you have someone who's had maybe copd or they've got a respiratory illness you should be screening for pelvic floor function because i guarantee you there's probably an issue i also had a lot of clients who had I actually, I had a couple that had developed weakness and prolapse in response to COVID, which I don't want to yell that out too loud, but um, chronic cough, let's call it chronic cough or respiratory problem or yeah, you know, um, yeah, they'd actually develop these symptoms in response to that. So maybe there was underlying problems already. I don't know, but it was definitely come about further on or they sought out help because of the lack of control after having these problem, um, this chronic cough. So yeah, respiratory disease is another one. Five, chronic constipation. Chronic constipation. Pelvic floor dysfunction can actually cause dysenergy, which is basically like the pelvic floor contracts instead of relax when you go to the bathroom. And this is usually often with bowel movements, obviously, but it means that um, it it means that there is a very hard time, obviously, going to the toilet. So there's going to be a lot of straining down onto the pelvic floor, which um, I guess is a really high risk factor for prolapse. But it's also going to just continually weaken that area, but it can cause a lot of, I guess, stress going to the toilet because you're going to be doing that every day. 
Um, but I guess it's, it is a bit more about like constant straining and downward pressure on the pelvic floor. So we can see chronic constipation or constipation come about from pelvic floor tightness because the muscle actually isn't like, I guess, lengthening enough to produce a bowel movement or help a bowel movement come out. But then we can also end up with pelvic floor weakness and prolapse issues because of a history of chronic constipation. So when we're thinking about like how we're screening all of these, it's really important to obviously go through all of these and understand all of these so that you can screen properly and understand what that person needs. That's what I think is important. Um, sixth one, eating disorders. Maybe not considered as a problem in a sense of the pelvic floor itself, but it is actually more around the lack of nutrient availability to maintain muscle mass and function that affects pretty much all muscles at this point in time. But obviously the pelvic floor is a muscle. So we have issues around that. So like lack of protein or lack of general nutrient availability to strengthen and keep muscle tissue tone well or high, shall we say. Um, but there's also hormonal considerations in those who go into something more like an amenorrhea state um, and digestive complaints that also affect the bowel health. So if we're thinking about low levels of hormones affecting the pelvic floor at a time of maybe menopause, amenorrhea is probably going to be quite similar because they uh, haven't got a menstrual cycle. We've got low levels of hormones around or um, which then influence the tissues of the body in general, but the pelvic floor being one of them. Um, and then we also have like digestive issues. So if you're uh, going through some sort of disordered eating and you are, I guess, then having digestive concerns about this, then we've also got issues of either diarrhea, mostly constipation, most likely, but obviously affecting the pelvic floor as well, just like chronic constipation, I guess. And then the seventh one is connective tissue diseases. And this could be like Ehlers Danos syndrome, Marfan syndrome, and hypermobility syndrome. They're all impact connective tissues and this includes the pelvic region so we've seen a lot of um prolapse issues come about from like um these types of conditions where the tissues are just so stretchy or like mobile that um they can really impact the function of the pelvic floor so if you have clients in those areas um, or that have um, problems around that then screen for pelvic floor issues because you're going to need a lot of strength in those in those clients. Then we have things like gynecologic, gynecological disorders. <laughs> I'm having troubles with my speech today, sorry. Um, the two biggest ones obviously here are hysterectomies and endometriosis. So the, both of them will have really different impacts on health of the pelvic floor and surrounding structures. But when you're thinking about a hysterectomy, obviously we're removing some of the organ there. So there's extra space for things to move around. But then we also have like... Um, changes to hormonal status as well, based on removal of the uh, female organs. Um, then we have endometriosis, which impacts the pelvic floor a lot. That in a topic is a topic of itself, but endo, pelvic floor problems, pelvic pain, obviously it's all related. Um, but those are two other factors that contribute to pelvic floor dysfunction. Nine, myofascial disorders, where there's probably more like asymmetry in the system. So disturbances that maybe impact the alignment of the system and then ultimately feed into the pelvic floor. So we know that um, posture plays a really big role in the pelvic floor and the alignment of the system, as well as obviously the kinetic chain. So if you are moving through everything poorly because there's some sort of myofascial disorder, it will feed into the pelvic floor and create problems there. And the last one that they talk about is trauma injuries like pelvic fractures or blows to the pelvis, a fall, anything that has basically caused like a physical trauma to the area that can then impact the pelvic floor and how it functions. So we get a lot of change to muscle activation patterns in that point as well, point of time. But then there's also the pain cycle that comes into play as well that will impact pelvic floor. So there is a list of 10 here that... Um, I guess, factors that contribute to pelvic floor function, um, which when you think about all of these, it is so far from, I guess, pregnancy and postnatal health that it really gives you a new perspective on pelvic floor function and who you can see as clients or who your clients are that might actually have these problems that you haven't asked about yet. But it is really important to consider this. And this is something that I am super passionate about is like, it doesn't matter where you are in the female life cycle it it like it's it doesn't favor pre and postnatal health to just have pelvic floor problems that is just something that is really exacerbates the problem and i feel like we talk about it a lot more and it's more openly spoken about because women can almost say like oh i've had a baby so i've got pelvic floor problems whereas if you had pelvic floor problems in something else it's a little bit less talked about because maybe it feels a bit more embarrassing for your clients so 
I think um, when I see uh, when I see that health professionals advertise pre and postnatal pelvic floor health, I often really do wonder like how many women would read that and then say like, oh, that person isn't for me because I'm not I'm not pre or postnatal. So like they can't help me. Whereas when I talk about my services, it's basically all women of the female life cycle anywhere. Doesn't matter where you are, I can help you. And I get, I actually don't see that many pre and postnatal women to be quite honest, because I don't market myself as like one a mums and bubs or pre postnatal specialist, but like a pelvic floor guru, I want to say. <laughs> Maybe not guru, but like, you know, professional specialist I don't know whatever you want to call it but yeah I think it's so important um and this is another reason why I wanted to create the mentorship program and why the mentorship program is a six-month program because um the pelvic floor is so extensive so in every module in the program covers we go through like different ways that it affects um different parts of the female life cycle or how it might prevent or what we need to be considering at different parts of the female life cycle or different conditions health conditions in a sense of how do we treat this so like we look at yes there's a standard treatment model in a sense of like what we should be doing as a whole but each time we need to modify this based on what's going on for that person and you know why they need to be able to I guess um focus on different parts of their rehab because they've been through chronic coughing or they've been they've got an women's health condition that's impacting their pelvic floor so we need to manage that or whether it's like okay well it's actually a weight management issue or it's a postural condition that's come about from maybe a previous injury rather than sort of being specific to birth and postnatal health so if you think that you um want to learn more about this i would love to have you inside the mentorship program because i think that us fitness professionals, health and fitness professionals have a huge role in this because pelvic floor requires a whole body movement-based approach in order to really rectify and resolve problems long-term as well as teach them strategies to manage this, like to clients to self-manage this into the future and understand all about this. So we have a big role and I'm really, I feel like it's a missing for us a little bit in a sense of how we can go about helping our clients like this and not always having to rely just on physiotherapy treatment or referring out for physiotherapy treatment or maybe just internal exams like we have a huge role and if we have a really big understanding of this in its role in everything it can really be beneficial for all clients even if they're not pelvic floor specific um it's all it's such a it is such a big part of central stability that if you are seeing must clients this could be part of your missing piece of your treatment that is really helpful for you. So if you are interested in joining this program, that the applications, this is an application only program because I only have 10 spots available in the mentorship program because it is such an intensive program. Plus there is quite a lot of one-on-one -on -one support in this as well. So if you are interested, there is a wait list that started. I've started the wait list. Um, I've already started the wait list. <laughs> And um, I put the link in the captions or the, the description of this. So you can join if you would like to. The applications will open in December and we will kick off the mentorship program in January. And it will be obviously for the six months. Um, there's a couple of other things going on um, inside the details, but I'll share, you, share those details with you more when we go through the application process in December. But otherwise, I do plan on bringing in some smaller bite-sized pelvic floor education in 2024 because I know that a lot of you don't want to commit to a six-month program. So keep your eyes out on that. They're not going to be straight away, but they will be coming out slowly across the year. So make sure you're on the email list if you want to hear about them because that's where I'll tell everybody first. But until then, keep just keep an eye out on all the different people that you see in your work environment. And maybe they are pelvic floor clients and you just don't know yet. Or maybe they have pelvic floor problems. Maybe they're not, you know, actually pelvic floor patients, but they might have pelvic floor problems that you haven't considered that might be a bit of a, a game changer in the sense of your treatment style for them, but also helping them talk about it. Because if they haven't told you about it, then it's quite likely that it's embarrassing for them. And sometimes being able to say, oh my gosh, yes, I'm so glad someone's asked me because it's been a problem for years. Is such a nice relieving feeling for patients. So yeah, there you have it. This was a little bit of a ramble, but 
The paper is great. I've linked it below for you to read. Thanks again for being here. If you're still listening, I'm super grateful. Um, I love obviously sharing this content. I hope you find it really valuable. I'd really love and appreciate it if you share this with someone that you think would find value out of this because my goal is to help more practitioners feel confident in helping women in whatever that might be. So there are lots going on in the back end for her education um, and I would really appreciate you passing on the word. So thanks again and I will see you in the next one. Bye.